Can you hear me? I'm fine. Very good. Uh, in Zoom, can you hear us? All good? Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, welcome, really. Um, thanks for <laughs> having the space for us, uh, for uh, this tryout that, you, that we want to do in this session, and thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, so the idea for us, Camila, can we go to the next one, please? Perfect. So the idea of this mini workshop is that <laughs> A bit of dynamic that we wanted uh, to do is the following. So the objective really is uh, try to have a better understanding of the concept of open science that we have from the perspective of collaborative projects. Um, how do we conceive the concept uh, in terms of benefits, barriers that we might have, um, but also successful practices? depending on the kind of projects that we are working, right? And the kind of, um, uh, on the kind of collaboration that we have established and where we practice open science. So the idea would be the following, a little bit of context. We will spend a few minutes um, presenting the context, the slides, the dynamic. Uh, we will have two interactive surveys that should be very quick. The first one is one with multiple options. And the second one is, some open questions that will help us uh, understand this uh, or achieve this aim, hopefully. And just to let you know that the outcome of this session is uh, will be will be used as the basis for a survey that we want to do a more global one as a part of um, an SSI and OLS fellowship project. So I'm, I'm one of the I'm, I'm one fellow that joined the, the community this year, and we also have another project going on on uh, open life science that you hear about this amazing project just uh, just now uh, that is trying to do a mapping of the different actors in open science in Latin America. So the idea will be use these inputs that we hopefully will get from you and fit this to the project and to understand a little bit better about what is the context uh, of open science in the region, in the south, in the global south in particular. So thanks a lot, really, in advance for all the inputs that you can give us today. Um, very good. So the global question, are the current concepts, practices that we have been working with lately around the open science, global and universal? So I think all the community here um, agree on why working in open science is good and what are the benefits that we get, right? Um, our question is, are the practices, are the barriers the same? Um, is the concept really the same? Can everything on the different practices that we have been developing in the last few years applicable everywhere? And this is something that has been discussed it's said in, in, the late, in the last years, right? Um, and it seems in general that there is, this is not the case. I mean, depending on where you're coming from, um, the, the local realities, maybe you cannot implement the same kind of practices in terms of open science, right? So if we go to the next one. And in this particular case, we will be discussing this from the point of view of Global North and Global South, but this is even more complicated than just geographical, right? I mean, we can have uh, differences if you are working in cities and if you are working in rural zones, for example. So there are many, many variables that can impact the way that you are working and how open you can be in your communities and in the practices, in the projects that, uh, that you're working on. So let's go to the next one. So um, we are doing this as a part of, of a collaborative project between three different communities of practice. Um, we have La Conga Physics, Metadocencia, and also an amazing um, support by the Software Sustainability Institute, the Open Life Science, and also uh, the Turing Way. So globally, these uh, communities have the following principles, good networks, inclusion, equity, capacity building, recognition, local and global collaboration. So I didn't introduce myself, 
um, the collaborators today or the facilitator is me. Nice meeting you. Um, I'm a particle physicist. Um, my name is Reina. <laughs> I'm a particle physicist working at uh, CNRS, uh, which is in France. But also, I, I am part of an Erasmus Plus program. It's a collaboration and alliance between Europe and Latin America that is called uh, La Conga Physics, Latin American Alliance for Capacity Building in Advanced Physics. And this is a one year master program that takes place between universities in Latin America and universities in Europe. And a big part of what we are teaching to the students is good practices of science reproducibility. So a big pillar of the teaching that we are doing is how to code better, how to um, have practices of science reproducibility in the way of work. I'm trying to do this at the beginning of their career before they move on uh, afterwards, whether in academia or anything. Perfect, then Camila. I am Camila. I'm a research and science research coordinator in Institute, and I've been a long time collaborator of Dave Max since part of my career. And I've also been a contributor also to La Conga Physics, so also a way I've been a, a, a alumna of, of Open Life Science. So happy to be here. And finally, we have uh, Nicolas. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Nicolás Palopoli. I'm a computational biologist in Argentina, um, but I'm speaking here on behalf of Metadocencia. This is our community where we work to make the production, uh, communication, and application of scientific and technical knowledge equitable globally. Uh, we are mostly focused on Spanish-speaking communities, and we do this, this, this work, and we we rely on these principles of networking, inclusion and equity, um, building capacities and working um, locally with a global uh, reach um, by developing these uh, collaborative networks, uh, creating learning spaces and li like our workshops and building accessible resources. Again, mostly for Spanish speaking communities, but um, open and free for the whole world. Raina? We can go to the next one. And yeah. can you explain a bit what would be the dynamic with the surveys? Yeah, so we're going to work on Slido. We're not going to be focusing on the share notes, uh, although you have the link if you want to put your names there. But we're going to have two different surveys on Slido. You can join by uh, scanning the QR code or just by going to slido.com and using that name on the screen that number on the screen, sorry. And the idea is that we're gonna have two surveys. Um, each of them will take us about five minutes to, to complete. The first one is mostly based on multiple choice and short answers. And the second one gives you more room for, for discussion and for writing your thoughts more freely. Um, the only thing that you should care about is please, use the same identifier, which could be your name or an alias or your email, whatever you want as an identifier, but use the same in both of these surveys so we can connect them. Um, can, you, can you still hear me, right? Yes, um, all good. Okay, good. So um, please, uh, Camila, make sure that we have the, the, the survey open. So you can go there and um, write down your answers. After the first survey, we're gonna be back to discuss this, this your, your responses, and then we'll move into the second one. Is that okay, Reina? Yeah, all good. I think we are here opening already Slido. And please, those connected in Zoom as well. We have already 12, 13 participants responding, which is great. And that we will have around five minutes to answer this question.
I will just add that apart from the poll, you have a Q&A section on the top that you can use to leave feedback for these surveys, which is very helpful because this is a pilot survey or an, an open one that we will share in the following weeks. So it can be feedback regarding the wording or regarding information that you think it could be useful and that is not being asked in the survey in the context that we're discussing. So any feedback really use the Q&A as well. We have a couple more minutes, maybe. Yeah, give giving the account. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the um, plug connector on this phone is broken, and I can only get power into it through wireless charger. While I'm charging, I need a new phone. And, uh, <laughs> that little socket thing's got like two things. I think. So. <laughs> we have about a minute left, but there are some people still filling it up. So please go ahead and get to the end so we can move to the other survey. Okay, this is the position of the title of people that have responded. It was quite diverse, yes. Mostly <laughs> results of our engineers expected. And we have a decent. 
Okay. Next. Okay, most of the people that have responded so far are in academia. We have also a few from intergovernmental organizations, trust and institution, industry, nonprofits. <laughs> Expected. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, but we still have uh, Spain, South Africa, Cameroon, Mexico, Brazil, United States, Germany, and Spain also participating and represented. Mostly uh, English, okay. And uh, ah, working the, the language that you use for work is English, okay. Perfect. So we have uh, fifty percent of uh, the replies are coming from people from and mostly working in the global north. 20% uh, come from the global north and work globally in uh, different kind of collaborations, international collaborations. 30% from the global south and working in the global, uh, from the global south and working in the global north. 13% global south and work globally. And 6% uh, come from and mostly work in the global south. More than half uh, is working on projects that involve stakeholders, mostly in the global north. This, I think this is expected. Um, no, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, which of the following aspects are, you, are for you the most important part of open science? The top three, open software, okay. Open access to data and open access to educational uh, resources. Yes, and it's interesting. Yeah, it's true. It's true, it's true. It's also. Yeah. Ah, we have to. Okay. Yes. So my comment was that. So we were saying it's a bit surprising that open access to scientific journals is so down. There were a few comments I'll pass the micro now. My comment was that because like over 50% of the respondents work in the global north, probably they don't have had so many issues accessing scientific journals as other kinds of audience. So that's why it's not top priority. Also in my line of work, if you have a thing coming out in a scientific journal, it's usually a year or two too late. So we publish everything on preprint servers and that is the common source of truth. So I don't care about open access that much anymore because we have archive. Yeah. So uh, regarding the three, the three benefits you think open science can bring to your work or research field, we have collaboration, reproducibility, equity, um, reduce, I'm not sure <laughs> what, okay. That is that, okay. <laughs> 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 I want a sentence. I want to split. Was well, a split in different words. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's right. Maybe. Okay. So the good thing is that when we don't know the data, we will get the. Ah, <laughs> uh, we have one. Yeah. And what? This working, yes, yes. And um, so I wanted to offer on that question the benefits, the trustworthiness of science and scholarship, whether or not we can base decisions that are going to affect the future of humanity on it. 
critically it depends on people's ability to scrutinize it and check whether it's bullshit or not pardon me um and that's why i think caring about open science is important because the 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 place that reason decision making has in the world as opposed to just making stuff up um requires transparency and people won't believe the conclusions of research without open science which didn't fit in the box now regarding the negative uh, parts or perceptions regarding open science <laughs> it's very difficult yeah <laughs> but who wants to comment on some of the questions that were given i think it's very similar to what you just said i in my uh, science i'm very worried of people that don't have the necessary skills to actually read it to read it and make their own funny conclusions climate science weather science is always like oh yeah we find this thing where it's kind of not like we expected and it's like a minus 0.1 percent of of an effect but then it goes into the news and people say oh yeah uh, climate change is not real and you're like that's not what we said and you are not capable of actually reading the open science so it needs a lot more communication ish yeah. i'm gonna be a bit argumentative now <laughs> i'm gonna put my science communication hat on and say that um i think we should trust a little bit more the public i mean how much have we seen that has happened with fake news even without open science there's always been so many misconceptions and information going around so if we just make it available let's see what happens and people have access to resources that they wouldn't have otherwise so miscommunication will happen anyways sometimes we need to trust that the public can also get to those points because they have access to so much now and those so many resources available they're not contrasted whatsoever so what is worse right I guess it's really followed up on that. And I think some examples we've seen is with the open science, when we don't really inform people the pur purpose of preprint and the purpose of peer review uh, and how preprint can actually perpetuate knowledge that are not correct and not verified. And we've seen the harm of that during the COVID. So um, definitely giving access to people to data and knowledge that we're sharing is important, but what is more important is to give them the skill to be critical and to investigate the knowledge we're providing is to question, um, giving them entry in the science, not from the way of receiver, but the contributor and challenger of the system. And another one that I added, I think everybody would laugh at this, but the XKCD uh, picture of dependencies of software um, and how much people actually benefit on the top from the work of the people on which they work built on. Um, so I, I definitely think that what is the, harm of open science in my field, and my field is really open science, is uh, actually people working hard don't get the benefit as the private corporations. Yeah. So on the open science risks abuse point, I'm more on the side of share it anyway, because people will not will even trust it even less if they don't know what's in it than if they, uh, if they do know what's in it. The, on the negative side, what I worry about is when we give long lists of improved practices, better ways to do science, which we often do, that makes people who are earlier in that educational journey to get that feel a hostility. Oh, no, now I've just learned that in order to be a valid scientist, not only do I need to do all of this stuff, I've also got to get all the code out and I've got to do repeat, repeatable computational experiments, I've got to stick it all on GitHub, et cetera. And that's an exclusionary barrier to entry. So how do we make it so that the feel of educational materials is welcoming rather than hostile to those who haven't read them yet is the big challenge to making this work, I think. Otherwise, it's just another, ha-ha, I've created some more hoops for you to jump through before you're allowed to be a scientist. I think not that in the Zoom. So, so there is a second poll, but please keep discussing. You don't have to fill it up. We're not going to be able to discuss the answers of the second poll, but please do, do fill it up. 
but we, we will keep it open for the rest of the of the session and yeah one hour or so uh we had one here and then here uh yeah thank you this one yeah so someone was talking about how to make uh, information a little bit more digestible to the public, for example. And this is something I have been engaging a lot lately with like grassroots communities and communicating kind of science and research. And I've been using a lot of art, uh, like interactivity, for example. And that is something that it's way easier to digest for the public, especially when they are not used to digest these like facts or statistics or I mean, even for one that it's supposedly academic, it can be a little bit too much sometimes. And I have found that art is a really fun way to also communicate these kind of things and also not to be so serious when something is serious, which it needs to be serious, but you need to find that kind of way of making it appealing, I guess. So yeah, probably art, I don't know. Jan and Gina. Um, yeah, I wanted, sorry, I was going back to Malvika's point, I think a bit similar um, to what she said that, uh, for example, big corporations benefit from, from the use of open source code that has been developed probably for free or with very little resources. Um, I think we also in the global north need to be more conscious when we're talking about open data, about data sovereignty and data colonialism. Um, so who is benefiting from data that has been produced in communities that then lose ownership of that data and never see the return of it? Um, yeah, so that's a reflection. Yeah, Jan, you want to add? Thank you. So I agree on the last point, especially about making data available in the language of the people you collected it from, right? That's easily forgotten because we are publishing in English. I want to put as a barrier this, that it can seem overwhelming. And I think this can be, seem like, because there could be a lack of uh, knowledge for many about what is the easiest I can do to just do just enough open science, right? You don't have to do the whole shebang because we have lots of lovely products we want everyone to use, but that can be too much, right? So what is the smallest thing you can do? Is it just like, yeah, I put my CSV file up there and I called it something nice, but that's, that's a big step, right? So we should make it easier to do that, those small steps that can make a big difference rather than, you know, all the bells and whistles and so on. But it should be benefiting yourself as well. It's a message to yourself in the future. Like, my work is about reproducibility. So for me, it's important to write down which software did you install so I can run it again. This benefits yourself as well, right? Because when you come back one year later and the code doesn't work anymore, well, if you had saved the environment list, it will be there for you. And those will be more like little tricks that just as a side effect is also good for open science. And that's why I like this uh, open life science initiative with training and so on, right? Because to build that knowledge step by step. Just want to check if there is any hands raised also on Zoom. But no, it's all fine here. Yeah, I want to respond to that because like my argument isn't to make science closed because it is an, it is actually an issue of communication because certain information is only digestible at certain levels. If you only have a high school diploma in biology, those people always argue with me that my gender isn't real because apparently they have passed high school. If you go to the whole, um, the, the people that take salt stuff and think it has, or like drink water and think it is homeopathic, they talk about quantum entanglement which is a real thing, but you need a physics understanding, not necessarily a degree, but a fairly high level of understanding of physics to actually understand what quantum entanglement is. But people use these fancy words and then there are fancy like publications. So if you do open science, you also have to think about the audience. So if we publish openly the very high level, well, 
it depends what you define as the high level, the very advanced physics stuff, then you can make that accessible to the public, but you have to make it accessible. You can't just throw it into the public and say, here, you can read it now and not just leave it without context. If you want it to be accessible to the broad public, you have to make it accessible and communicate it in appropriate ways. And that is not happening in a lot of places currently. And like, especially in climate, which has been open for like climate science is the example of like open data, open this, open that. And people still go into the IPCC report and see, oh, it's chaotic simulations. and try to take that as uh, discrediting the entire thing when we're like no we're doing physics you misunderstanding one word and it's like i don't know it's it's definitely a communication issue but if you want to make science open you have to make it appropriately open yes my own yeah anyone would like <laughs> 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 sorry because i just arrived i wanted to see this conversation but i missed the time but when you talk about about uh, the, the the risks of openness as as in as in there is misinformation outside i think that we have to be definitely if we are advocating for open, open science we have to advocate for science literacy in school like like and and we have to revert the position of scientists as um, figures of authority. So so this comes in hand. Like like you can't have one with the without the other. And this is we are changing the way we do science, but also we have to change the way we communicate it and the way uh, kids are taught and and even what we think about in terms of what cultural like general culture is, because you have to read the classics, but also science sometimes. At some point, it fell through the cracks, and and and, and like, what do you want a citizen when when their children to know? So this has to be. We are facing now the consequences of having used science as a position of power and of authority in many places. I think we need to close now, <laughs> but but please. Let's continue this discussion afterwards in the coffee break. We have now the welcome drinks and dinner. So let's continue the discussion. The, um, the survey, the second one, will remain open um, for, for the workshop. No, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot.